In this lecture, I'm going to describe eight common sources of malware. Removable media, documents and executables, internet downloads, network connections, email attachments, drive-by downloads, pop-ups, and malicious advertisements. Malware source number one is removable media. The very first computer virus, way back in 1982, was called the Elk Cloner virus. Elk Cloner targeted Apple II computers, and its effect was that every 50th time users booted up an infected computer, the computer would display something called the Elk Cloner poem. The poem went like this. Elk Cloner, the program with personality. It will get on all your disks. It will infiltrate your chips. Yes, it's Cloner. It will stick to you like glue. It will modify RAM too. Send in the Cloner. Here's how Elk Cloner spread. Back then, computers stored practically everything on floppy disks. Every time a floppy disk was inserted into the computer, the computer would run code stored on the disk to load or boot the disk onto the computer. Elk Cloner would start out attached to the boot code of a floppy disk. When an infected disk was inserted into an Apple II computer, Elk Cloner would copy itself onto that computer. Once the computer was infected, it would copy Elk Cloner back onto any uninfected disks that were inserted into the computer at a later time. As you can imagine, since everything ran on floppy disks back then, a user's disk library could easily become infected all the way through. If a user ever shared an infected disk with a friend, which of course many users frequently did, then they would spread Elk Cloner to their friend's computer, and that would likely infect most of their friend's floppy disks as well. Elk Cloner was what is called a boot sector virus, living and propagating in the boot code on removable media devices. We don't use floppy disks anymore, but we still use removable media that automatically loads when plugged into a computer. These removable media devices can still carry boot sector viruses today. USB flash drives are popular carriers for boot sector viruses. One tactic for spreading boot sector viruses via USB drives is simply to leave infected USB drives on the ground in public places. Curious people will find the USB drives and frequently they'll plug them into their own computers. These people are often good Samaritans who are just looking for information that will help them to return the USB drive to its rightful owner. If you find a flash drive in a public place, never plug it into a computer, just leave it alone. If you feel compelled to be a good Samaritan, you could take it to the nearest lost and found and hope that the owner checks in on it, but you should realize that the people at the lost and found may not have the cybersecurity understanding that you have. They might try to plug the USB drive into their own machines after you leave. In that case, you would have been instrumental in delivering the virus to the victim. Malware source number two is documents and executables. A virus is a specific type of malware, one that attaches itself to a legitimate document file or a legitimate program file. Mundane documents like word processor files or PDFs can contain viruses. So any means of sharing documents is potentially a means of sharing viruses. The good news is that viruses that are attached to a document or an executable file cannot infect your computer unless you interact with them. That is, you have to actually open the document or run the executable file for the virus to take hold. What do we do if many of the file types that we use every day can potentially contain computer viruses? Obviously, we can't just refuse to open all files. If we did that, we couldn't really use our computers. What we can do is use discretion. Only share files and storage devices with people that you trust. Don't share files or storage devices with people that you don't trust. And if somebody you trust shares a suspicious file with you, remember that you don't have to open it. If something about a file from a trusted friend seems suspicious to you, you can usually just delete the file or call the person up on the phone who is sharing it with you to get more information about what it is that they're sharing. Malware source number three is internet downloads. In a previous lesson, I talked about Trojan horses. 
Trojan horses are malware that come disguised as legitimate files. Trojan horses often originate in internet downloads. For example, a website might offer free downloadable games, but when you download the game files, they could install games and malware onto your computer, or perhaps just the malware and no game at all. Because of the danger of Trojan horses, it's important to know the sources that you download from. You should only download known files from people that you know personally or from vendors that you trust. When you see good deals on downloadable products online, you should always approach those deals with skepticism. If you do not trust the vendor, don't download the product. If you don't recognize the vendor, then the safest thing to do is to ignore the offer. If you don't know the vendor, but you feel like you can't ignore the offer, then you should at least research the vendor on a couple of trusted review websites before downloading anything from them. Malware source number four is network connections. Some malware don't even need human assistance to reproduce and to infect new computers. These malware, usually called worms, distribute themselves across networks without victims having to interact with them at all. Anytime you're connected to a network, either to a private network or to the public internet, it's at least possible that your computer could contract a worm from another computer on the network. It doesn't matter whether it's a wired internet connection or a wireless connection either. Worms can spread across either. Some worms spread across the world, infecting millions of internet connected devices in a matter of days or hours. Of course, most of us connect to the internet every day, and some of us never disconnect from it. So how is it that we aren't constantly contracting worms? Well, worms can only spread if they can exploit some known security weakness in a system. When weaknesses become known, software companies usually send out remedies for these weaknesses. These remedies are called patches. Patches modify legitimate software to make them more resistant to security breaches. If you install patches for your software as soon as they become available, then your computer is much less likely to contract a worm. Another security measure that helps computers to resist worms is the use of firewalls. A firewall is a tool that controls the flow of information between your computer and other network devices. In this illustration, we see a firewall between a computer and a cloud, which represents the internet. The firewall will prevent unrequested internet traffic, like worms, from accessing your computer. It's a good idea to always run a firewall on your computer. Malware source number five is email attachments. One way that cyber criminals spread malware is through social engineering. Social engineering is the practice of setting up social situations that encourage computer users to let down their guard, to compromise their own cyber defenses. One common method of social engineering is to attach malware-infected files to emails. The email might claim to come from a known source, and the body of the email will usually say something that piques the reader's interest or makes them feel concerned. One example of a malicious attachment is the infamous love bug worm. The love bug spread itself through email attachments, and it would send itself to all of the addresses stored on a user's computer. It would arrive in a victim's inbox packaged as an attachment with the file name loveletter4u.txt.vvs. Can you see how the file name attempts to hide the real file type of this email? The file type is really .vbs, but the title tries to make the reader think that it's a .txt file. If you already know a little something about file types, you know that .txt files are usually safe but that .vbs files can contain malware. Many recipients were curious to see what this supposed love letter was all about, and so they opened the file, assuming that it was just a harmless note. Back in the year 2000, the love bug infected more than 500 million computers in just one week. Email attachments are incredibly useful, but it's important that you only open attachments that you can trust. Malware source number six is drive-by downloads. Many computer users realize that they can contract malware by downloading files from a malicious website. But what many users don't realize is that you can contract malware infections simply by visiting a malicious website. Whenever your computer pulls up a website, your computer is downloading and running code from a computer somewhere else on the internet. 
the web code that runs on your computer when you visit a website can contain malware. When simply visiting a website causes your computer to download malware, this is called a drive-by download. Because of the lurking threat of drive-by downloads, it pays to be aware of which pages you visit on the web. Avoid hyperlinks that take you to unfamiliar or untrusted web pages. Malware source number seven is pop-ups. Some web pages allow advertisers to display pop-up advertisements, which are advertisements that appear on your monitor in a separate browser window. Many of these pop-ups are just annoying, but some of them are legitimate security threats. Some malware distributors will use pop-up ads to direct users to a page that contains a drive-by download. Other times, pop-up ads will contain buttons, and sometimes clicking on those buttons will result in a malware download. One particularly sneaky variety of pop-up is called Scareware. Scareware pop-ups display browser windows that are designed to look like an antivirus program. The Scareware window will claim that it has scanned your computer and that it's discovered that you have a bunch of malware infections. To help induce fear, Scareware windows will often claim that your computer is practically overrun with malware. The window will usually contain several buttons, and if the user is tricked, he or she might click on one of those buttons. Clicking on scareware windows is a bad idea. If you click on them, they will normally direct you to a malicious website where you're likely to contract malware infections like the ones that the scareware window claimed that you had in the first place. Malware source number eight is malicious advertisements. Malicious advertisements are difficult to distinguish from regular advertisements. Malware distributors will sometimes pay for advertising space on legitimate websites. Unlike regular advertisements, if you click on a malicious advertisement, it will take you to a malicious web page, which may contain drive-by downloads, Trojan horses, or links to other web pages that contain some kind of malware. Now, to be clear, I'm not trying to imply that any of the advertisements on this particular page are malicious. In all likelihood, they are perfectly safe. However, you should understand that it's always possible for malware distributors to buy ad space. Of course, you can avoid malicious advertisements simply by refraining from clicking on advertisements altogether. You might find it helpful to download ad blocking software for your web browser, such as Adblock Plus for Firefox. This program will prevent most ads from displaying on your web browser in the first place. Okay, let's review. In this video, I've shared eight potential sources of malware. Removable media, documents and executables, internet downloads, network connections, email attachments, drive-by downloads, pop-ups, and malicious advertisements. My hope is that the better you understand where malware comes from, the better prepared you will be to avoid malware altogether. In the next lesson, we'll go into a little more depth on the topic of defending yourself against malware infections.